Bit of to Cockatoo and he is gone. He has a bounce, lines them up for nine. A super, super goal! You guys remember super goals? For those of you that don't know, the Super Goal was first introduced in the 2003 Wizard Cup preseason tournament. In the past, the AFL used the preseason cup to test out possible rule changes before the start of the season proper. Between 2003 and 2018, the AFL experimented with the Super Goal, which saw any goal that was kicked from beyond the 50 meter arc awarded nine points rather than six. Here he is again, and they got pushed in the back there, play on the call, and he's Sean, a clearance king, this guy. Yeah, he's off to the races. He could be at stall over Easter as he drives it deep to full forward. It could bounce for the super goal, yes! So, what happened to the super goal? Could the AFL adopt a nine-point super goal like the NBA did with a three-point shot in 1979? What would be the implications for the sport? We'll take a look at some recent AFL seasons to determine their outcomes had the Super Goal already existed. My name is Woody, and this is Wooden Spoon Data, the 18th best AFL channel on YouTube. If you'd like to see some more data-focused AFL content in the future, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Let's get into it. Get that bounce. Takes them on. This could be for nine. This is bread and butter. Being a superstar. <laughs> so to get this started, I couldn't go about our usual way of finding data, as neither myself nor Chris have any idea how to scrape the AFL's GPS data. Luckily enough, I found a Google Drive by Liam Crowhurst with X and Y player positional data going back a couple of years. Liam is the founder of Useless AFL Stats and has come up with some very interesting ideas for the football analytics world. You should definitely check out his Twitter to keep up to date with what he does. With that, we can filter out every shot from outside 50 and have a look at how it would affect the match and in turn the season. I'll preface this by saying some of these goals were marked from inside 50, but kicked from outside 50. But I figure if they can kick it under those conditions, they can probably play on and do the same. So we'll start in 2021, as that's as far back as I can go. Trust me, I would have gone further if I could. In 2021, with the addition of Super Goals, we see seven matches change result. The first one occurred with Hawthorne versus Essendon in round one. In that match, Hawthorne trailed by 39 points at halftime and pundits were debating the Hawks' chances for the spoon. From there, they piled on eight goals to one in the third quarter to eventually pull back the lead and win the game in the fourth with a goal to Tim O'Brien. In this new world with super goals, Peter Wright marks the ball about 45 metres out with about five minutes to go in the second quarter. Instead of going back, straightening up and slowly walking it in to slot it from 52, he wheels out to his right the umpire calls play on and he still drills it. This would be the reason the Bombers held off the Hawks 39 point comeback to win the game. The next match occurred in round four between Port and Richmond where Port won by two points. In this match, both teams managed to actually kick super goals with Jack Rewalt kicking two of them. The first one occurred in the first quarter. Jack marks it from 45 meters out on a slight angle and goes back to kick it from 52. In the second one, he intercepts a mark out of defense from Hamish Hartlett, nails it from 53 on the run. Speaking of Hamish Hartlett, in the third, Hartlett marks a dump kick out of defense at 51 meters out before walking it back and nailing it from 60. The impact on the score from these three kicks means that Port gained three points and Richmond gained six points. With that, Richmond walks away the victor, winning 83 to 82 away from home. The next match doesn't take place until round eight with the Giants versus Essendon. In this match, we again see both teams kicking super goals with the first one coming from Daniel Lloyd. Toby Green spots him 49 meters out on a 45 degree angle. Lloyd lines up and on his run in, he plays on and ends up kicking it from about 53 meters out. The second super goal happens from Mason Redmond in the third quarter. Redmond marks a dump kick out of defense 55 meters out. And from there, he lines up walks in slowly, only to play on and roost it from 60. The final super goal came from Kyle Langford in the fourth. With about two minutes left, Langford marks 48 metres out. Down eight points, he goes back, runs off his line and slots the goal. Essendon are up 102 to 101. From there, both sides kick regular goals and the match ends 108 to 107 with Essendon walking away the victor. The next match to have its outcome altered was in round 10, and we actually see two matches change result. The first is Adelaide versus Melbourne. In this match, Adelaide got home with some last minute heroics from Darcy Fogarty and Taylor Walker. 
with super goals, this wouldn't have been enough as Melbourne kicked a super goal in each quarter with one from Rivers, Harms, Petrarca and Oliver taking the win 107 to 96. The second was where Fremantle won against Sydney 86 to 84. This was another match where both sides kicked super goals with Lance Franklin kicking three and Chad Warner and Josh Treacy each kicking one for a new result of 89 to 96. The final different result in 2021 comes in round 17 between the Suns and the Giants. Toby Green kicks the first goal of the match on a turnover. He marks it from about 50 out and plays on to hammer it home with the breeze, getting nine points instead of six. That goal would end up being enough to change the final result in this match. So what does the season look like after all that? First off, the top eight teams stay in the eight, but seven out of eight of them change spots. The only one to stay in the same spot is first place Melbourne having won one additional match, now being two games ahead of the newly second place Geelong. Port lost to Richmond by a point in round four, ultimately losing their home round advantage in the first round of the finals. From there, we see this year's biggest ladder improvement in the Sydney Swans. After beating Freo in round 10, they have enough points to leap from the Lions and Bulldogs who are unaffected by super goals, earning their double chance. From there, we have seventh and eighth spot, both of these teams actually won two matches due to Super Goals, but we now have Essendon ahead of the Giants as the Bombers beat the Giants in round eight by a point. Now that we have different finals matchups, if we want to find out who wins the Premiership, we need to look at ways to determine the winner without using match points and shot data. Daniel Hoyne from Champion Data believes there are four key metrics that determine Premierships. For the defensive stats, you need to be in the top six for points against and scores conceded from turnovers. And for offense, you need to be in the top six for inside 50s differential and time in forward half. I don't have access to time in forward half, so I'm just gonna replace that with the more commonly accepted points four. So for example, in this new final series, to get the victory, team A would need to win at least three out of the four categories to win the matchup. And in the event of a tie, we'd go to golf rules, where the best one to 18 season ranking in each category makes the winner. Four of the very, very best. Footy held aloft. The first match is Melbourne versus Sydney, and Melbourne leads in every stat, so we'll give them the win and send them through to the preliminaries. But this time, Sydney lived to fight another week. The next match is a first elimination final between the Lions and the Greater Western Sydney Giants. Brisbane lead in all four categories and knock the Giants out of the finals a week earlier than before. The next match is the second elimination final between the Bulldogs and Essendon. Once again, we have a leader in all four categories and much like in real life, Essendon is knocked out of the finals. The final match for the first round of the finals is the second qualifying final between Geelong and Port, this time at the Cattery. Port win points four, but every other stat went to Geelong, changing the original winner to the Cats taking them through to the preliminaries. Sydney and Brisbane take each other on in the semis. Here we see Brisbane leading in three categories, only falling slightly behind the Swans in scores conceded from turnover. Brisbane now makes it through to the preliminaries to face Geelong. The next match is between the Bulldogs and Port, and much like in the original matchup, the Doggies lead in three categories, only losing in points against, sending Port home a week earlier than before. So now we have Melbourne versus the Bulldogs, taking place a week earlier than before. This was actually the first 2-2 split. Melbourne had better defensive stats in points against and scores conceded from turnover, and the Doggies won offensive stats in inside 50 differentials and points four. Due to the stalemate on golf rules as well, and because of how dominant they were in the 2021 Grand Final, I'm gonna use super goals from the 21 Grand Final as the determining metric. With three goals to zero, that sends Melbourne through to the Grand Final. That leaves Geelong versus Brisbane with the Cats winning three to one, only losing points four. Brisbane is sent home a week earlier than before. So our new grand finalists are Melbourne and Geelong, the team that came first and second in this new ladder. Much like in real life, we have Melbourne winning the premiership, leading in every category, but points conceded from turnover. So while Super Goals would have changed the results of some matches and the overall finals matchups, it seems unlikely to change the outcome of the eventual premiers. So let's look at 2022 now to see if we get some more dramatic changes there. Mini spoiler, we again see seven matches with changed results and no new teams enter the top eight. So let's go through the matchups a bit more quickly this time. The first match to change result was in round five between Carlton and Port Adelaide, where originally the Blues won by three points. This match would now be counted as a draw due to Ryan Burton's 55 meter goal with a minute to go in the third, 
giving Port two points and taking two points from the Blues. The next match would come a week later when Adelaide beat the Dogs by a point, 62 to 63. But because of Trelaw's 53 metre goal in the first, the Dogs now get up by two, winning 65 to 63. The next match wouldn't come until round 11 between Sydney and Richmond, where Sydney won 106 to 100. This match is where we see the most super goals in this whole data set, with a whopping nine goals between them. James, roll the footage. Yes, sir. Dusty Martin can go back. He loves to play on. He loves to kick goals. That looks great. Jack Revolt. Braden Campbell. Short in the middle now. And he can go long. Short. And Short can just have a lash at it. Has he got the juice from here? Empty goal square. Buddy Franklin. Kipkas looks online. It is. He kicks the goal. You probably noticed Richmond kicked a few more there. Well, they actually doubled Sydney's super goals, kicking 6-3. to three. This gave Richmond the win, 115 to 118. From there, we have to wait another seven weeks until round 18 between North and Richmond again. And outside the arc, opens it up, blasts it. It's got the carry, I think. One of their all-time greats. Gets it away, and gets it there. Drives it long, epic to Miller. He launches, goal square. There we see the Tigers kick six super goals, stealing their second victory, one of only two for North this season. After that, we have to skip a week and go to round 20, where we actually see two matches change results. The first is between Collingwood and Port. This match ended with the Magpies' victory, 88 to 82. Now Port kicks two super goals from Butters and Pal Pepper in the fourth to draw the match. The second is between the Suns and the Eagles, where the Suns won 107 to 104. Now the Eagles managed to get a super goal from Jack Petricelli in the third to also draw the match. The final match would come in round 23 between Collingwood and Carlton. To Carlton fans with a good memory, before you get excited, this win isn't enough to make the finals with the draw to Port earlier this season. But yes, after originally losing to Collingwood by two points, thanks to Adam Chera's goal halfway through the third, Carlton now get up 77 to 75. So now we get to look at the ladder and then the finals and see if anything major changed this year. First off, as I said earlier, we see no new additions to the top eight, but we again see some pretty interesting changes. The top two stay in the same order with the Cats on top and the Demons two matches behind in second. From there, we see Sydney fall out of their spot with a loss to Richmond, now falling behind Freo. In third, we have the most dramatic improvement in ladder position with Richmond jumping over Sydney and Fremantle from seventh to third with their two extra wins. Collingwood fall from 4th to 7th with their loss to Carlton and draw to Port, falling past Fremantle, Sydney and Brisbane, who, side note, managed to stay unaffected this season. In 8th spot, we still have the Doggies, whose 2-point win over Adelaide held off Carlton half a game behind them. So let's get into the 2022 finals. We'll use the same rules as before, with needing to win at least 3 out of the 4 categories to win the matchup, and in the event of a tie, we'll go to goal fools. In the first match, we see the Cats take on Freo, in which the Cats lead three out of the four stats, only losing in points against. The next match, we have Sydney versus the Doggies. With Sydney leading in all four categories, they kick the Dogs out of the finals and move on to the semis. After that, we see Brisbane versus Collingwood. In this match, we see a 2-2 result and we'll need to go to golf rules, in which we see Brisbane win thanks to the difference in points for, and therefore Collingwood is eliminated. Then we have the second qualifying final between Melbourne and Richmond. Melbourne gets the victory 3-1, only losing in points four, sending them to the preliminaries and Richmond to the semis. For the first match of the semis, we see Frio take on the Sydney Swans. Here we have another 2-2 matchup that has to go to golf rules. Sydney wins 19-27, securing their spot in the prelims and sending Frio home. After that, we have Richmond taking on the Lions for a loser goes home matchup, and it ends with our first 4-0 of the series. Somewhat surprisingly, Richmond led in every category by a few points, taking the victory and going to the prelims. For the first match of the prelims, we see the Cats take on Richmond. Here, the Cats take the chocolates with a 3-1 victory, only losing points for securing their grand final appearance. Finally, we see Melbourne versus Sydney, where the Demons also win 3-1, only losing points for. So we get to the grand final and we have the same two as last year with Super Goals. Will the Cats be as dominant as in real life or will the Demons go back to back? 
Well, unfortunately for Melbourne fans, much like in real life, the Cats claimed the victory and the Premiership, winning 3-1. They were much closer in golf scores than Cats versus Sydney, so maybe it would have been a closer match. But so far, it's looking like without having Super Goals included in the finals and using an adjusted version of Daniel Hoyne's four key metrics, we're not going to see major changes. Well, now what? It was at this point in the research that I was starting to get a bit worried that this wasn't a topic worth making a video about. I was kind of hoping we'd see a Premiership go to a new team and I'd have the perfect ending for this video. You see, one thing I neglected to mention to you at the beginning of the video is that the data set that I found from Liam Crowhurst is incomplete. It only goes from round one, 2021, up until round 16, 2023. At this point, I'm guessing half of you clicked out of the full screen and might have noticed there's still a bit of time left. That's because I thought, this doesn't feel done. It feels anticlimactic, and I started thinking, well, if it's not showing up in the data set much because we can't easily compare new matches in the past, especially with the pressures of finals, and it's not as if the players are trying to get super goals anyway, so how could I find out what the AFL might look like if they introduced it in 2025? The sport that has the most similar scoring profile to AFL is basketball, and basketball introduced the three-point shot. So why not? to encourage more attacking games and to spread the zone defence, do we not have the equivalent of a three-point shot? With X-score becoming more and more prevalent in our game, we can also draw comparisons with basketball there. Looking at NBA X-score, there has been a noticeable rise in comeback matches over the last 27 years. So what else might change? Thankfully, we can look at how scoring changed when the NBA introduced the three-point line. The NBA introduced the three-point line in the 1979-80 to 80 season after the league acquired the American Basketball Association where the rule already existed. Despite the introduction in the 80s, the NBA started to see a decline in scoring as teams shifted away from the fast-paced ball movement of the 70s and by the mid-90s, most teams took a deliberate, slower approach. In an effort to remedy the lack of scoring, at the start of the 94 to 95 season, the NBA reduced the distance of the three-point line from 23.9 to 22 feet. This prompted teams to shoot more three-pointers as the 94 to 95 campaign set then records in lead-wide makes, attempts, and three-point efficiency. Despite the three-point line returning to its original spot and dips in shooting numbers, nowadays we see three-point shooting at an all-time high. So using basketball shot data as reference, what might happen to AFL scoring patterns if we introduce super goals? When the NBA introduced the three-pointer in the 1979-80 season, it initially had minimal impact on the game. In the first five seasons, teams attempted less than three three-pointers a game and made only a dismal 26% of them. Based on the data that we looked at, with 673 super goals over 423 games in the 2021 and 2022 seasons, we would see just under an additional 1.6 super goals a game, or roughly three to six points. I think upon introduction, we'd see similar numbers of three to four super goal attempts per match. 45 years after the three point shot was introduced, teams now take about 35 three point shot attempts per match, or roughly 40% of total shots. If the AFL had about 40% of total goals be super goals in 2023, that would have equated to about 2,092 total super goals or about 9.68 total Super Goals per match, which comes to an additional 6,276 total points, or just over 29 points per match. So, would that happen in the AFL? Well, if we look at why there has been a recent increase in three-point shot attempts in the NBA, we should be able to figure out if that would happen in the AFL with Super Goals 2. In 2014, the average NBA team shot just over 23-point attempts. That year, basketball exec and data enthusiast Daryl Morey instructed his D-League team, the Rio Grande Valley Vipers, to shoot more three-point attempts. The math behind the idea was fairly simple. It states that shooting one-third of your shots from behind the three-point line is as good as shooting half your shots from inside the line. For example, if Team A exclusively shot 43-pointers at a rate of 30% or 12 out of 40, and Team B exclusively shot 42 pointers at a rate of 45% or 18 out of 40, then each team would have the same number of points at 36. However, Team A made six fewer shots, leading to six more rebound opportunities and therefore shot opportunities. In other words, shooting as many threes as possible will likely lead to a higher score. So, would we see a similar mindset in the AFL? I think so. Because not only would we have a similar equation to what the NBA has, but it would actually favour shooting from outside 50 more than taking a shot from three in the NBA. 
As in the AFL, if a player takes a shot from inside the arc where they feel they have a 50% chance or less of scoring the goal, passing to a player outside 50 whose chances are 33% or higher will always yield a higher expected score. This is mostly due to the fact that both players would still get one point from missing the shot inside or outside 50. Then you have the added bonus of the AFL's equivalent to rebounds, where in the NBA, if a player misses the shot, the opportunity to gather the rebound and stop the switch to offense takes seconds. Whereas in the AFL, after an offensive team misses the shot, they can then set up to defend the kick in. This gives AFL players more opportunity to intercept rebounds where scores from forward half turnover account for just over 27% of total scores. So I think we would see a similar change in the AFL with forwards learning where they're most effective at taking shots, which will inevitably lead to less shots taken on tough angles in the pocket as players favor finding the inbound spot up pass or taking it further out for a nine point shot. I do have an idea to make sure scoring from outside the arc doesn't become as dominant as the NBA, but before I say it, hear me out. We would need to get rid of behinds from 50. That's fucking stupid. I know, it sounds crazy, but a behind was introduced to settle arguments about drawn matches. If we didn't have behinds, draws would account for roughly 6% of all matches as opposed to the 1% they represent today. So while it certainly needs to stay in footy, if it's removed from shots outside 50, it provides a greater risk versus reward decision for the player and eliminates the problem from the equation presented before. So with all that being said, what do you guys think? Well, I think one thing everybody wants to see is the return of the talk, and this could bring it back. We could also see more importance placed upon kicking distance in the draft. I think we'd also see an increased emphasis on getting your half forward flanks and maybe even your forward pockets back deeper to create a zone defense around the defensive 50, protecting the nine pointer. This would also help spread on the rebound. Games in general could become higher scoring affairs, potentially making that more appealing to the casual fan. However, some might argue that cheapens the value of a traditional goal. Close games could become even more unpredictable with a single super goal potentially swinging the result more drastically. So, would the AFL benefit from a nine point super goal? Would the AFL need to remove behinds from outside 50? Are there any other potential rule changes you think would be necessary? Do you think there's anything I've missed? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. And as always, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe button if you want to keep up to date. I'm Woody and this is Wooden Spoon Data, the 18th best AFL channel on YouTube. Thanks for watching. The sport that has the most similar scoring profile to AFL is basketball. And basketball introduced the three-point shot. So why not, to encourage more attacking games and to spread the zone defence, do we not have the equivalent of a three-point shot yeah, in it. football? The night, we've the, had it in the pre-season games. Yeah, but they've always mucked around with it and turned it into a bit of a circus thing. Instead of saying, well, why not have a nine-point goal for so outside, outside the 50? 50? No, outside the 50 is nine points. I love it. It's a goal and a half. Love it. Teams that are a long way behind can start taking shots from long range and try and bridge the gap. And also, teams that have deficiencies in other areas can bridge the gap on the big teams just by having a great nine-point shooter. And you know what it will do? More torpedoes. Yes. That's what we want to see.